Welcome baseball fans, young and old, to the 2018 Backyard Baseball League All-Star Game. I'm alongside my co-host, Pedro Alvarez. It's great to be here. I'm Ken Griffey Jr. Jr., and we're ready to really get cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Rock and roll. Go ahead and tell us our opening lineups for tonight. Sure thing. So for the Houston Astros, we have Sammy Sosa, Jose Canseco, Luan Louis, Pete Wheeler, Raul Mondesi, Sean Green, Keisha Phillips, Cal Ripken, and Kenny Kawaguchi. And of course, this team is headed up by honorary player manager Paul McMichael. Give us the uh, lineup for the Backyard Baseball League All-Stars. The Backyard Baseball League All-Stars is stacked with Ahmed Khan, Juan Gonzalez, Pablo Sanchez, Chipper Jones, Barry Bonds, Larry Walker, Derek Jeter, Ken Griffey Jr., and Angela Del Vecchio. And we're having more fun than you can shake a big stick at over here. We want to give you just an idea of how we're going to roll with this. We're going to cut to the live broadcast of the offensive portions of each team's performance these games are happening right now they were by no means played at an earlier date there was there was zero previous absolutely Derek zero and paul are playing these games at this very moment and we're going to bring you all of the rip roaring offense that that involves yes first to the houston astros which is our pro league all-star team playing the pc's new york mets at parks department Number two. What a matchup. Without any further ado, we bring you out to the field. And that's the last you'll hear of Sunny Day. On the mound, we've got Kurt Schilling facing Kenny Lofton. You know, it's interesting watching Kenny over the last uh, few games. He's shown some incredible speed and uh, savviness on the base paths. And that ball is fouled off to the left. A bunt attempt. Strike one. I was talking with Kenny's parents before the game just about what they feed the kid for breakfast. I guess it's a mixture of oatmeal and beans. I feel like that would surely cut down on my speed. That is a, uh, another pop fly caught by the catcher, Pudge Rodriguez, for the first out of the inning. Pete Wheeler, of course, when he's on the mound, has the... Uh, potential to throw a monkey ball or scrambler. You know, I faced a scrambler once when I was in the league. And now one's up first ball. You don't really want to face it if you don't have to. It scrambles more than just the plate. It scrambles your mind. The 1-0 pitch is popped up on the infield. Jeter camped under it. And he's got the second out of the inning. Can of corn. Keisha Phillips strides to the plate, of course, batting from the right side. First pitch is over the outside part of the plate, a swing and a foul back. I've Strike always been one. impressed with the healthiness of hacks that Keisha takes at the plate. I tell you what, she is really making a difference in the uh, women's rights movement within backyard baseball. There's a little bit of a confusion out there in uh, right center field as to who's got that ball. And that, of course, was the top of the first inning for the pro ball club. Three up, three down. It does not bode well. So then we go to the top of the first for the humongous Bombers. Up first for the Bombers, we have Derek Jeter. Now, Derek Jeter, now, doesn't he belong to that team of shortstops? The entire team, all of them shortstops? I think so. I think he's a member of the Monsters Club over there. That's low and inside for ball one. Now, the question is, has Derek Jeter's influence in the front office in Florida made a difference to uh Got to stop you for a second. Team? There's a small ground ball to the right side, fielded cleanly and out for first foul. Man, that small ground ball business gets you every time. Up next at the plate, Barry Bonds. Now, Barry Bonds, of course, had a resurgence in his career after he started eating healthier breakfasts. A left hook from Kurt Schilling high for ball one. 
Now, I think it's worth talking about Barry Bonds was taken second overall in our backyard baseball draft. Bonds lays down a bunt, hustling to first base, and he beats it out for a clean base hit. Now, your your own appraisal of that. So, Derek Barnhart took Pablo Sanchez. Who is now coming to the plate. You got it. First overall in the backyard baseball draft. Why would you not? That's a, yeah, that's a obvious pick. It's a savvy move on the GM, Derek Barnhart's. Let's talk about Pablo Sanchez's numbers a little bit here. That's a uh, swing and a miss for strike one. What kind of production have we seen out of him first half? Bonds has been explosive in the first half, posting nine homers in just seven games. And Foul you, tip for strike two. And that is, that's Pablo, not Bonds, correct? That is correct, yes. Pablo with nine bombs, which is more than... Bonds with a healthy leadoff from first base. More than four teams. Pablo hits a dribbler to the mound. Schilling throws the first, and he's beat it by a foot. Now, would you say that that's been common? Uh, Pablo does have excellent speed, and I think... If I had to categorize him, I'd put him down as Mr. Hustle. Up now to the plate, Ken Griffey Jr., who also boasts some serious pop. So we have runners on first and second with nobody out. Ken Griffey Jr., that's my dad. <laughs> Low and inside for ball one. When he named Trey Griffey George Kenneth Griffey, and he passed on being... Ken Griffey Jr. Jr., I, of course, seized my moment and took it. That is your rightful place. The last one was in there for a strike, followed by another hook for a second strike, one and two. We have one out now, runners on first and second. Griffey at the plate, the one-two delivery. Low outside, ball two. It's worth noting, Kurt Schilling seems to be having a subpar day, maybe a little under the weather there at Parks Department number two. Allergy season, I hear. It's low and inside, making the count full. You know, back in my scouting days after I finished my incredible career as a backyard baseball kid, I watched Schilling from a distance and uh, fouled off to the right side. He did have some, some serious gas, but he always seemed to be flustered after a few hits. Maybe a little less composure than you saw out of Kurt Schilling in previous years. The 3-2 is popped up on the infield, and the infield fly rule will be in full effect. Two outs. And I've talked with the uh, manager of the Wombats, Pat Cook, and he said he's not gotten quite the performance out of junior that he'd like to have. Swing and a miss from our next hitter, Larry Walker. Yeah, you know, performance is... Uh, a high expectation at the beginning of the year, but uh, you know, for these kids, it's a lot of pressure. Another swing and a miss from Larry Walker on a ball that looked like it was high and outside, 0 2. I mean, let's be serious. My dad is only five. There's a ball put in play to the left side, running over to get it, and tries to make a play at third, but chooses poorly as the bases are now loaded with two outs. Ripken Jr., I feel like making a serious mental mistake at third base. Very uncharacteristic of him. These kids need to stop thinking about their snacks and thinking about the game. All right, looks like we've got a quick stat check on Juan Gonzalez. He is indeed a 9-7. Bags are juiced here with two outs for Juan Gonzalez. The pitch. Called low and inside for strike one. Looks like Juan didn't like the call but won't get much discussion from the home plate umpire. The 0-1. Called strike two again. Juan looking back to the umpire with some distaste. You know, honestly, Ken, I don't know if I would ever swing at that pitch. You know, I think it's worth talking about the performance of the umpires in the league this season. I think that there have been times when I have seen pixels in the strike zone, and it has been called a ball. Agreed. Juan hits one to the right side. All runners advancing. A biff at first base, and Juan is safe. The Bombers score their first run of the inning in the first inning. I don't know. This may be a little early to start talking about the uh, end result, but the first inning is a big one. 
big one. Very true. Chipper Jones at the plate now with the bag still juiced and two outs. Chipper lines a shot right up the middle. Fielded cleanly and out at second. I, the Bombers manager is oh coming out of the goodness. dugout to ask to go to the booth, but they're not going to ask them to go to New York and review the play. Unbelievable. Only one run with the bags juiced. That is absolutely incredible. Now, uh, I want to get back to what we were talking about previously. We discussed Pablo Sanchez's power numbers as, as compared with the rest of the league. Can you shed any more light on that and all of the extensive coverage that you've done on the secret weapon? Yes, honestly, it's been quite the excitement for me to be able to cover such a phenomenal player. I mean, the kid has everything that you'd want. He's got power, speed, best defense around. Not only that, he's got the mental aspects that you want a guy, a true, fully groomed 5 tool player. Specifically, his power is one that I think he, uh, he's very patient at the plate, leading to pitches that only he thinks uh, and knows that he can drive. Um, he's very consistent with his approach. And honestly, from talking to him, though I had to use a translator, it sounds like he's uh, eating and had a great change in his off-season diet. I tell you what, this kid is going to be the MVP this year. I'm calling it now. In my opinion, I'm tired of the diet conversation. Why doesn't somebody just man up and lift a couple weights? Enough of that. Let's go to the top of the second here with your uh, Houston Astros, managed by Paul McMichael. And we've got Sammy Sosa up, who's uh, playing a catcher here. He's got a swing and a foul ball back. That'll be strike one. You know, they call him Slamming Sammy. Do you know why that is? Tell me. I heard it's because when he gets mad, he slams his fists. I've actually heard a story about a jukebox being pounded to smithereens in a locker room. That is strike three looking to Sammy Sosa. He's going to take a seat. Raul Mondesi coming into the batter's box now. You know, Raul has been... Uh... There's a ground ball to the right side and just barely foul. We'll take it back again. That's 0-1. Been a player that I've kept my eyes on, but uh, I heard that. And just a little dinker there to third base, but it looks like it's going to stay fair. Not quite. Veering foul. Strike two. I heard that the GM, Derek Barnhart, decided not to draft him due on not being able to pronounce his last name appropriately. Well, I think uh, Derek Barnhart made a serious mistake because Raul monesey has got himself a single bagger. He's going to try to take second, but thinks better of it and retreats back to first base. That was a nice piece of hitting them there by Mondes. Yeah, he's got... Uh, over 600 batting average in a home run and uh, I believe double-digit RBIs for the Expos. Calvin Jr. takes a look at ball one high. There's a real good throw on down to second on a steal attempt by Raul Mondesi, and he's caught in a pickle. It seems as if he's outsmarted the infield and he has retreated safely to first base. Yeah, I'm not running on Pudge's arm. That's what I'm talking about. Paul McMichael giving us just a little bit of insight into the the bench conversation oh, he's shit. having. It seems as if we may have a double play. Oh, talk about some speed over there. Cal Ripken Jr. just barely beating out that throw. Way to hustle, kid. To keep the inning alive. Way to We've hustle. got two down with Jose Canseco on. Cal Ripken on first base. Kurt Schilling starting to really deal. But I think that the Astros have something a little extra special up their sleeve. I hear talk of an undergrounder. My, oh, my. And there's a strike in the outside corner to even count at one and one. You know, my biggest question is, what is the ball doing while it's underground? You know, I only see the entrance and the exit, but uh, what kind of route does it take under the grass? All I know is there's a lot of top spin, and that the Gophers are not very friendly. We've got ourselves a one-two pitch coming. Found back. We'll do it again. You know, it's been interesting to see. Uh, the effective use of power-up hits. And there's quite a range of strategy across the league. I know of uh, the Expos and the particular approach that they are taking. We've got a 2-2 pitch coming, and that's also low and run count full has Kurt Schilling, um, who intentionally strike out the first three batters of every game 
to get more special pitches. Here's a, uh, a hook that wow. gets Jose Canseco looking. looking. That is absolutely incredible. So like I said, even when you get that special pitch, uh, then you got a chance to hit that in play and then get a special hit. Right. But even once you get the special hit, is that guaranteed? Absolutely not. No, and it's it's, it's about pitch selection, too. You have to understand when the right time is. And it looks like uh, he did the right thing and swinging at that one pitch that was foul, as we saw, which is unfortunate. But, uh, you know, that's just the way the ball bounces, literally and figuratively. Absolutely right on with that analysis. We are going to pick up here with uh, the... Uh, Backyard teams here in the top of two here in just a moment. But uh, as as we get ready for that, yes, go ahead. I was just going to make one note if I could. So, you know, there's there's strategies, as you were aforementioning, with, yes. with power-up hits. And, uh, you know, it really is a kind of risk-benefit question you must yes. ask yourself, which if you're looking for the double play, obviously a guy gets on base and you're trying to get a ground ball. But sometimes it doesn't happen. The guy has a good hit. It's now two on or three on, and now you're in a real pickle. That's absolutely true. Let's go again to uh, top of two here. And we've got Ahmed Khan at the plate for the Bombers. Now, I know Ahmed Khan has been the absolute bright spot for the Wombat so far this season with four dingers. Wow. Uh, looking real good there. Wow. I was outside for ball one, just missed. Schilling with the 1 0, called inside strike. It looks like Schilling has really been pounding the inside of the zone. That was an absolute dirty left hook. Don't try that at home, kids or adults. Ahmed with a towering fly ball down the left field line. Is it fair? Just foul. Ahmed making the sad trip back to home plate. Is that missed by just about five feet? If I would have had to give you the call as soon as it left the bat, I thought for sure out of here. Ahmed with the one-two hits a fly ball to shallow center field, and it's dropped. Unbelievable. It looks like this team wasn't even prepared to come play today. Uh, I would say uh, on a high note, I think that ball made an improvement to Nomar's face. Up next at the plate with uh, Ahmed on first is Angela Del Vecchio. Angela is actually batting in the nine spot today as she's the pitcher. She boasts somewhat decent stats for hitting, but uh, she's in that spot for a reason. I don't know. We may see a sacrifice bunt here. He's taking off for a second as Angela lays down a bunt. Both are charging hard to their respective bases, and Angela is thrown out at first base. That was a smart move, in my opinion. It's uh, advanced the runner, put him in scoring position, and now you've got one out. In, an ad in addition, you don't have Angela Del Vecchio uh, occupying first base, getting us out of the double play, and then also giving Derek Jeter room to run. Jeter with the uh, pitch. He lines out hard to Kurt Schilling, who almost had his head taken off. Now, in talking with Derek Barnhart about managing this game, he, he may not have had as much power as he's used to. Would you say that that's the case? Swing and a miss from Bonds with two outs. Yeah, I definitely, uh, I definitely agree with that. It sounds like uh, the GM was more favorable to his own squad. Bonds with a little trickler. Will it stay fair and will he be safe? He is safe at first base. Wow. Bonds hustling hard to first and beats the throw. I'm very curious to see how that plays uh, again as we continue the conversation of speed versus power. That could that could translate into another run right there. First and second for Pablo Sanchez at the plate. Always a dangerous hitter. A left hook is swung on and missed from Pablo. And uh, I've mentioned before, I think Pablo's small strike zone has the opportunity to be a, a liability we'll see here. A heater on the inside called for strike two, and Pablo didn't like it. Man, I wouldn't want to upset Pablo Sanchez. He might speak to you in Spanish if you got him upset. The 0-2 is hit to second base and caught for the third out of the inning. Wow, well, they threatened with a few... Dinker hits and uh, couldn't come to fruition. Yeah, here we are now at the uh, end of that second inning. We've got a 1-0 lead still of uh, the Bombers over the Astros. You know, it was interesting watching some of those uh, players field. I always preach and preach and preach as an announcer to uh, different reporters and people that I just feel that the backyard kids 
don't practice enough. I know their parents are very legalistic about what time they have to be home for lunch, what time they have to be home for dinner. But gosh, give the kids a little like leash. Come on, these kids got to perform. And if they're not doing that, then I don't know how they're going to be asked to succeed, you know, by their GMs. And specifically on defense, that is what makes or breaks teams. A strong defense, especially a strong middle infield. And if those guys are going to drop those simple pop flies and catches and make the simple plays, it's just not going to work out. And, and I identify strongly with that because I have a daughter. And her name is Vera, and she's playing on... Uh, Vera Griffey, Jr. Jr. Vera Jr. Griffey, Jr. Vera Griffey, Jr. Jr., who's Jr. playing on... On the Expos right now. Wow. And uh, she's playing well. Um, she's definitely performing a high above her value of undrafted. Sure. Uh, but I want to see her handled like she like she should be, like the star that, yeah. that she's born to be. Well, sure. let's pick it back up here with the Astros in the top of three. With Kurt Schilling on the mound here again in the third inning. Sean Green, who has been an absolute... Solid pickup for the Expos. He was part of the trade that took place before the deadline. There's a sinking line drive to center field, which hits Ken Griffey Jr. square in the back. He falls down, and Sean Green is safe at first base. I'll tell you what, that kid's mom is going to be upset that he has a bruise tomorrow. My dad's tough. He can take it. We got Luanne Louis, the little speedster with the teddy bear at the plate. And it looks like player manager Paul McMichael is really biding his time with that underground or not, not getting too excited. You know, I think that's smart. You really want to, like I, I said before, be efficient with when you decide to use the undergrounder. And I hope that all the player managers right now are, are learning a lot. I think that's extremely important that we're getting to see two upper echelon player managers go at it. Here's a little ground ball to the left side. Sean Green making his way to second base. Kurt Schilling has picked it up. He's thrown to second. Sean Green has made it safe, and Luan, of course, safe at first. That only reiterates my point that you need to have sharp defense. Dropping balls like that is really going to hurt you in the long run. Which it doesn't surprise us uh, with any person more than it would with Ken Griffey Jr. in the way he got hit in the in the keister there. Ken, Kenny Lofton with an undergrounder, and it's popped up all the way in left center field. It's going to bounce off the wall. Sean Green's around to score. Luann Louie is making the trip as well. Kenny Lofton's looking for third. And then a weak throw from, I believe it was Nomar, puts it in the outfield. Ken Griffith Jr. can't return the ball in what time for Kenny Lofton on? to get the inside the park home run. I can't believe what I just saw. They couldn't get the ball in from the outfield if they had a cannon. And they didn't. Unbelievable. Which has put the Astros up 3-1 to one over the backyard team. So now, of course, the bases are clear for Pete Wheeler. Uh, and he'll use all the bases if he gets the chance. You know, Pete uh, Pete is not a guy you want to just throw meatballs to. Pete has got the power and the potential to really uh, change a ball game quick in a hurry. Here's the 1-0 pitch. And there's a bunt popped foul. You've got Larry Walker, I believe it is, at third base, playing probably within reach of Pete Wheeler's breath. And there's a low ball, too. It's two and one. You know, Pete is of the unique kind. It looks like he has pretty pale skin. I wonder if his mom puts on SPF 30 or 50. I think it's probably 50. He whacks a pitch out towards third base. Derek Jeter coming over to cover, and he's recovered it for the first out. I guess I would use 52, even if I didn't have pale skin. 52 or 52? I would use 50. Two as and, well. And that's a strike to Keisha Phillips, 0 and 1. Kurt Schilling continues to deal. Here's a pitch over the inside part of the plate that Keisha hammers to the gap, which happens to be in center field with the shift that they're playing, but the right fielder ranges over to haul it in for out number two. That was a great guy dive by the right fielder. Sammy Sosa comes to the plate. He's 0 for 1 today with a strikeout. And a swing and a miss on a ball on the inside corner. You know, I know I talked earlier about diets with uh, these backyard kids. I feel like a lot of them eat cereal. You know, I uh, I ate a lot of cereal as a kid. What kind of cereal? Oh, it, it varied, but uh, I'd have to say my favorite was the uh, the Lucky Charms. 
and the red balloon. Sammy Sosa hammers a ground ball through the right side, but doesn't have the speed to beat it out, and that's the third out of the inning. Wow, that was uh, extremely unfortunate by Sammy. And let's, yeah, like I said, coming back to that speed conversation, Sammy Sosa, great bat. Excellent bat. Not so great on the base paths. Now, is he... Isn't he technically an eight in speed? Maybe we're just seeing a bad day out of Sammy Sosa today. You know, directly, I don't know what Sammy's actual uh, ball count is on speed, but I do know that he holds a lot in the trailer, and it's hard to unhitch. So. Yeah, I know that uh, whatever the case is, I'm just glad we're talking about ball count. Exactly. It's uh, It's been interesting to get to know some of these kids too. I know that we look at gameplay and performance as their ultimate, you know, descriptions, right? Well, how much speed do they have? Do they have great power? But when you really get a chance to sit down and talk to these kids about how coloring is going in class and, you know, how well they're succeeding in, uh, in addition and subtraction, you really get to know them on the individual level. And it really helps paint that full picture that, hey, these ball players are just kids. And ball players. Let's go to the top of the third with the Bombers. Up first for the Bombers, we have Ken Griffey Jr. I don't know how Kurt Schilling feels. Uh, pitching against both All-Star teams sounds like a nightmare. You know, Kurt Schilling is lights out. He really is. His heater is phenomenal, and his location is exceptional, especially the inside of right-handed hitters. The first pitch is called for a strike on the low outside corner to Griffey for strike one. Now, Parks Department number two is home to the Montreal Expos. That is correct. Left hook called for strike two. Well, again. I think that another interesting conversation we should continue to have is about home field advantage. That is a great, great discussion. Low and inside for ball one. Player manager of the Expos, Jordan Helwig, contends that uh, Parks Department number two is one of the only fields in which home runs are not excuse me, taken away from lefties. The one-two is called high for ball two, two and two. In addition, it's more or less neutral. You know what you're going to get. There are no uh, severe disadvantages, but there are parks with those kinds of disadvantages. That's true. There are. It's outside for a close, but called ball three to make it four. And Griffey sends one high and deep to right center field. Sosa doesn't even move in right. He knows it's gone. Ken Griffey Jr. showing some serious power here, putting the Bombers up 2-0 to zero against the CP. You. I am trying not to cry, but my father has made me quite proud yet again. Ken Griffey here boasting some serious power with a drive that lands beyond the trees outside the fence in right center. And it looks like the total distance for that ball is going to be unknown as we saw it travel so far. We didn't even realize how far it went. That is what I'm talking about, Dad. That is what I'm talking about. Now, it seems as if we've had some kind of transmission interruption, but uh, I believe we can remedy that very quickly. And here we are picking it up uh, with the bombers. So, excuse me. as we see Larry Walker come to the plate, let me uh, just give let a... Let me just take one quick second. There we go, and I'll get us back here. Let me give a though. quick note, if I can, some uh, statistical analysis on, on Larry Walker. I know that with Derek Barnhart being the, the PM for that team, uh, Walker has done quite well for himself, boasting six home runs over seven games, coming in second to Pablo Sanchez on the team. Wow, that is incredible. And, of course, second on the league. No no other player has that many home runs. I think the closest after that would be Ahmed Khan with four. Yes. Ronnie Dobbs has three for the Expos. Uh, I believe Sally Dobbs also might have three. Wow, that's just incredible. That and is here, incredible. Here yeah. is Larry Walker. So Walker looks like in the transmission area accrued two strikes called on him. So we'll come in and see what happens here with the 0-2 pitch. Again, coming back to home field advantage. Fouled off. The team to talk about here is the D-backs. The D-backs. The D-backs are playing at Tin Can Alley. Okay. And the keen observation was made by the player manager of the athletics that he has not played at home since week three. The 0-2 is fouled again. And all of his recent success has come on the road. Interesting. With six innings of offense. 
But now with five innings of offense and back at Tin Can Alley, what's going to happen to the D-backs? And I, I guess really the question is, would you ever pick Tin Can Alley as, a, as, a, as your home field? That is a great question. Uh, Larry Walker found another pitch off, one and two. I don't know if I would. It really would have to accentuate the strengths of my drafted team. And honestly, that's a draft day decision by the GM. But um, on its face value, Tin Can Alley isn't as appealing to me as it may be to others. And that's what I'm trying to think about is what kind of draft strategy are we talking about? Where you're like, I need Tin Can Alley right now up in my world. Kurt Schilling with ball three to make the count full. The three two. I'm still thinking about that. Hi, ball four. That is some great plate discipline there by Larry Walker for Schilling to get ahead 0 2 and end up getting walked to first base. Seems as we have some kind of quick substitution here, or at least a look at the stats. What do we got here? Uh, up next for the Bombers is Juan Gonzalez. Juan Gonzalez is one for one today with a base knock. Tin Can Alley is just one where, oh. what do we got here? Looks like Larry was thinking about taking two, but decided otherwise when he saw the arm of Pudge Rodriguez. I believe Pudge Rodriguez is behind the dish for both opposing teams here today. And there's a drive. Deep right center field. Way back Sosa to the wall. Caught by Sosa at the wall. Unbelievable grab. I believe he brought that one back. I can't believe what my eyes just saw. He reached way over the fence to bring that ball back in for the yard. Phenomenal catch by Sosa. I I almost cannot believe my eyes. In fact, I need to see that play one more time. I mean, that was a turn, dead sprint back to the wall effort by Sosa. Not that he sprints very fast. And still manages to come up with the baseball. How did he do that? Unbelievable. I'm telling you, off off the bat, I'm I promise. Two run tater. Two run tater. That's it. You just two run tater. Bye. I and we're gonna watch this big back this pitch back from Kurt Schilling. Out over the plate. The exit velocity on this ball has me thinking it's leaving the yard right now. I but, mean Sosa is still running while at the wall. Unbelievable catch. That's gonna go down as one of the highlights today from the All Star games. Incredible. Up next for the Bombers is Chipper Jones looking to redeem the team after that highway robbery from Sosa and Wright. Looks like he's thinking of laying down a bunt here with Walker around first. A left hook bunted down the first base line by Chipper. Chipper hustling to first. Walker safe at second with an errant throw. Well executed bunt by Chipper Jones. And I really think that uh that's normally I I might say the biggest factor in a high scoring game is watching the the other team's defense fall apart. Yes. We'll see if that happens at all here in the remainder of this game. Ahmed Khan receiving the first pitch low for ball one. Ahmed Khan is one for one today with a single. Do you really believe that Ahmed's headgear are earmuffs or are they headphones, like actual it, headphones? I think they're both. I think they protect his ears when he's working on trees and working with heavy machinery and then also functions as a conduit for rock music. Ahmed Khan swinging at a pitch low and away, called strike three. That's going to put two outs on the field for the Bombers, who still have runners down first and second. Angela already with her second trip to the plate. Low ball one. You know, I think Angela really has the potential to be a two-way player. You know, if we look at the actual adults in the world, such as Shohei Otani, we see the success he's having at the plate and on the mound. There's a special pitch. The elevator called for high strike one. You just call that girl Shohei Girl Del Vecchio. I like it. Shohei Girl. There's a rip to the right side. Getting through the infield. Runners are advancing, and Angel headed to first. 
called out as she just doesn't beat the throw to the bag. That does hurt. Wow. Unbelievable. I promise that hurts. I do. What else do you have for us here, Pedro? So one thing I wanted to, to mention today, Griff Jr., 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 is the fact that I think that we're going to see quite the shift in the second half of play. Why do I say that is I believe that some teams just get hot. Here's what I mean. Let's take uh, the first place Bombers, for example. The Bombers have showed exquisite power so far in the first half of the league. Mm, but from their upcoming schedule, it looks like they play some pretty tough divisional leaders. Now, if I had to guess, I'm going to put my money, money on the fact that the uh, Bombers are probably going to have a lower run differential game by game heading into the next uh, few weeks of play. Now, and so you, you are talking then about not this game, but about the season. I am referencing the season, yes. And it'll be interesting once the uh, conclusion of the season arises because I know that the GMs are paying close and special attention to the stats that players are posting. Draft day is always an exciting day. And honestly, as an announcer, being Pedro Alvarez, it's my favorite day. And here's why. We get a chance to see what the GMs are really thinking, who they value, why they value it, and what they think that value is going to do for them. I couldn't have said it better myself if I were saying it. And so I want to take just a second, since we are at the midway point of this game, getting ready to go into top of four, Mm -hmm. I just want to bring up some of these stats that we were talking about. So, So, again, let's bring up the schedule here. Sure. Here on the schedule, we've got, uh, what we've seen so far is uh, a trend of more and more runs scored um, by a couple of teams, namely the D-backs and the Expos. There's been a consistency in high scoring by the Bombers and then uh, maybe just under them in, in consistency in run production would be the Athletics. But like you said... Uh, with the Bombers coming with some division rivals here, and then in addition facing some uh, pretty staunch opponents here, the Expos in Week 10, we could see a shift in those predictions. I like what you're thinking. Any uh, assumptions as to why the D-backs have had a sudden increase in their run differential? I don't know if it comes back to some of that uh, home away discussion we just had. Or if there's anything else you can attribute that to, I, in my conversation with the player manager, uh, I think that there's been a a significant uptick in base running, that it's been capitalizing on noodles behind the plate, taking every possible base you can, and then just trying to play smart from there, trying to play smarter baseball. That's a great perspective. I think that it really boils down to a, a managerial role. You know, how is the manager responding to his players after a few tough games, you know, where you don't beat your head-to-head matchup and you're three, four weeks into the season, yeah, you're course. thinking, you're thinking, hey, am I really going to be able to produce? What do I need to change? How am I going to change? And I think that's uh, that's uh, just shows that the player manager for the D-backs uh, did what it took and uh, produced some results. Absolutely. And so I'm going to take, again, the opportunity to just bring some statistics that uh, the player manager of the athletics has brought to our attention so here's here's run differential over the course of the season you can see by team by week and then the average range median and then nobody knows what the interquartile range or standard deviation even means i believe that the standard deviation is going to be a difference in run differential over games two to six, I believe, is the explanation. I could be way off on that. But what's interesting here, if we're really looking for, you know, what do these numbers mean to us, right? These are, these are great numbers, but how do we take these numbers and properly evaluate the league? What I'm noticing here that really pops out to me is, one, the average run differential for the Bombers. I know we had from our discussion the power threat the Bombers pose. I believe that as Pedro Alvarez, myself, watching the initial analysis at the beginning of the season, it was not recognized. And I was shocked because you have to understand that two things win ball games: defense and offense. You got it. I couldn't have said it any better myself. 
if I had said it. But of course, the game changer is the the, the giant shift. I'm just going to bring this up one more time. So as we look at the league, and that's that far right column over there. So by week, the average run differential, just under five, just under six, just under seven, eight, seven and a half, 12.86 there in week six. Wow. And of course, coming back down to a little more of a... Um, earthly and less astronomical number of 7.71 but the, the truth is there that we are seeing an increase in runs but i i've heard whispers that that's that may come back down we may see a regression because the game may be getting harder not easier that's true and one thing i want to add to the run differential conversation is the fact that pitching plays an important role obviously when we think about run differentiation we automatically assume that that's an offensive statistic when in reality the other half of the coin is defense right we're talking about what kind of runs are we inhibiting the other team from having and that just contributes to the uh, positive correlation of run differential again to my point mm. two things win ball games defense and offense absolutely don't forget it and with that incredible Insight. Let's go to top of four. Kurt Schilling still on the mound Where in the, the top Astros. of the fourth. So far, he's only got 35 pitches with two strikeouts and not a single walk. And here, Kurt Schilling will still be dealing. It looks like a fastball over the plate. Raul Mondesi with a tapper foul to the left side. Strike one. You know, Kurt Schilling is uh, really showing some good stamina here as a kid. Hook to the outside part of the plate, but it's up out of the zone. It always impresses me how much these kids rely on their juice boxes to perform during the game. And let's keep the terminology of juice box clean for all the folks at home who don't know what we're talking about. Well, as a kid, my juice box still had breast milk in it. Is that clean? Here's the 2-1 pitch to Mondesi. And there's a ball struck foul. Not that I credit my raw power to that. I'm just stating a fact that there was important nutrients in that. The 2-2 pitch fouled back, and let's do it again. I've since shied away from that concoction of juice. And I'll prefer 100% fruit juice. And here's a ground ball to the second baseman. Toss on to first for the out. Calvin Jr. with one away. Uh... And for the viewers at home, I feel like we've done you an injustice and instead not cleared up the true meaning of juice box in this game. That's a foul ball, a foul ball back. Strike one to Cal Ripken Jr. We are indeed talking about something more like Kool-Aid or Red Pop. There's a pitch on the inside that is struck at the third baseman, Larry Walker, who tosses on to a, uh, Jeff Bagwell. Wow. Too late to cover. Cal Ripken will pull out the single there. You know, that was a, a good showing of arm strength there by the third baseman. I believe you said Jeff Bagwell. Jose Canseco, who's 0-for-1 with a strikeout on the day, I believe, looking with a ground ball back to the pitcher. Kurt Schilling on to second base for the first out. Jose Canseco making it to first to break up the double play. Now, I know that in talking with Paul McMichael, Jose Canseco has not been used in much of a, a power context, but more for his speed. Just like you saw right there, that's a um, ball one away to Sean Green. And speed is important in a lot of aspects. I, uh, you know, as an announcer, I've had the opportunity to see many different player managers have their hand at uh, executing, whether it's speed-based teams, power-based teams, defensive-based teams. And honestly, there is no real golden ticket at this point. Taking a hack on a ball on the outside part of the plate, and that is lined weakly to the third baseman. For the third out. And there we go. We've got the top of four done. You know, and Astros. In talking, too, just about, uh, you know, these kids and speed and power and defense, I want to just make a note that I think part of it has to do with, uh, you know, just the kids' character. We talk about that idea of getting to know kids on an individual level, and I believe that some of these kids are just well raised, good parents. Good influences, a home church, things that really help mold and grow the youth from a young age. And I think that really affects their on-field performance. More so 
than breast milk and juice boxes. Let's come back to top of four with the Bombers. Derek Jeter leading off with Nomar now on the mound, replacing Kurt Schilling. Low for ball one. Nomar has quite the uh, windup with the right arm hanging and dangling from his side, which I believe he told me earlier in a press interview he does to, quote, intimidate the kids, end quote. I heard in an earlier press release that he has an owie or boo-boo on his ring finger. Also a viable option. The 1-1. One, one. An elevator pitch bunted down the third baseline as Jeter takes off for one. And Jeter will be called out with a close call at first base. And I am a firm believer in the purest approach we have here. There are no reviews of these kids' performances in which we could call that back. The pitch to Bonds is high and outside for strike one. Now, Ken, do you believe that the backyard baseball officials should institute a review policy? There is just this video board here in Parks Department 2. There's a ball dribbled in front of the plate for out two. And uh, I think that it's just for the fans. I think that that's the way it should be. Mm. Replay is for the fans, the players, the managers live in the moment. Sure, makes sense. An elevator pitch hit foul by Pablo Sanchez. 0-1. Now, I haven't seen a whole lot of uh, noise out of Pablo here yet. One for two with a single. The 0-1 is skied high on the infield. Nomar racing in to field the pop fly. Pablo takes off for second, but it's caught. That's going to be the third out for the Bombers, who are still only at two runs. I feel like they've just been going quietly one inning after the other. That's true. You know, honestly, I think we look back to that one inning where Sosa had that fantastic grab on the right field wall, which really uh, took some of the breath out of the Bombers there in that game. I've seen a difference in them at the plate. And uh, here as we get ready to come back in and look at the Astros. Let's let's get bold. Okay, I'm good with bold. Let's start dishing it. I can dish it. When it comes to the performances and the predictions of the second half of the season. I love it. We talk a lot about what ifs. I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. What are we looking at second half? You tell me, what's hap- What's going to happen second half? That's a great. That's a great question. I think, not to be too cliche, anything can happen. Anything can happen. I want to know what's going to happen. One thing that I feel that people uh, don't do enough of is is look at history. Right? We we talk about America, we talk about Mexico, we talk about Canada. Yes, we you, do. You we name it. We better look do. at history if we want to know what the future of those countries are. Now, with backyard baseball, I like to take a similar approach. Let's look at just the history of some of these teams and where they've come so far. We look at who's leading the league right now. The Bombers have an 846 cumulative win percentage. And these are numbers after week eight. After after, after week eight for the Bombers anyway. So go go ahead and, and give us those numbers. So with that 846 win percentage for the Bombers, they're posting a 4-2 and p.m. record with an 8-0 and backyard baseball record. But what really stands out to me is their total run differential. It's not even close with the rest of the league. They're posting 116 total run differentials, with the second closest being 87 by the Athletics. Now, the top three teams, Bombers, Expos, Athletics, both have incredible talent. I think it's duly noted that with the league and the way that the playoffs are set up, that anybody has a real shot to go all the way. Absolutely. And as we also mentioned earlier, the the game itself does get harder. In my opinion, from my my spectatorness as an announcer... And I believe that's going to influence and affect the way that we see the second half. So to make a long story short, Ken, I have no clue what's going to happen. I hope that whatever happens, it's extremely exciting. There's absolutely nothing of what I asked for, but that is how announcing goes. That's my political answer. Thank you, and good night. Here we come back to uh, top five here with the Astros, Luan the Wii. Oh, yes. One for one with a single... And uh, an exclamatory, oh, yes, from player manager Paul McMichael. So it looks like... Luan Louis racing to beat out this slow ground ball, and she's in there easily with a single. It looks like the player manager Paul McMichael is doing some sort of strategy on defense in order to accumulate these special power-ups. Now, of course, we don't know what happened. 
we don't know what happened. And that is unfortunate, but it's just for the sake of time. And so we'll have uh, we'll have to have some some type of filling in conversation on the tail end to see how we got just this much power. There's another foul ball away to Kenny Lofton. He's quickly in a hole, low and two. You know, when I was in the backyard baseball league as a player, you know, when I was a kid, I uh, often had the aluminum power bat. And there's yet another foul ball away. And my mom tells me that she tried hunting down all the baseballs that I had hit with the aluminum power bat, but that with her having a parole officer and not being allowed to cross state lines, she couldn't find all of them. Strike three looking. Kenny Lofton, take a seat. Surprised we didn't see Luan Louis running on any of those pitches. And here's the first one to Pete Wheeler. He swings at a heater inside. It looks like they're going to be safe everywhere. Wow. And that is just a thing of beauty to watch two, maybe the fastest two players in the game beat out an infield hit. Phenomenal. Keisha Phillips with a screaming line drive out to right field. It's going to be over Juan Gonzalez's head. Luan Louis is rounding third and heading for home. Pete Wheeler looking to make his home at third base, and he is safe as well. You know, you mentioned that speed, and that really pays off there when you have a screaming line drive and two on. Sammy Sosa, 0 for 2 with a strikeout. We'll look at ball one down. Keisha Phillips is going to take second base without any complaints from Pudge Rodriguez. Interesting choice by Pudge, clearly knowing the speed threat that Pete is on third base. A chance here to really break this game wide open. Sammy Sosa with a tapper foul. You know, Sosa, with, uh, without the speed, I feel like he's due today for some power. And Sammy Sosa sends one absolutely skyward for a home run. Yeah. I believe that was aluminum power. I do have my glasses on, but it was still hard to follow that ball as high and as far as it went. Now, a quick side conversation as the Astros climb to a... Seven to nothing lead over their Mets. Does an aluminum power home run feel less satisfying than an all natural home run? You know, with my many years of coverage and seeing quite the amount of power, whether it's natural or aluminum, I have to say that it's just not as, as exciting for me. You know, with the aluminum power, you know what's going to happen, right? But with the regular power bat, it's like, hey, this kid has all the power he needs. Mondesi takes a strike. 1-1. One, one. A slow ball out over the plate. Round Mondesi jumps all over it. You know, with the Astros now climbing to 7-0 lead against the computer here, I want to just continue our discussion, which is... Ground ball up the middle. It's going to get by the pitcher, Pudge Rodriguez, and uh, second baseman. Which is the fact that... Oh, looks like we're going to pick up our transmission here. This is great. Let me just continue my... Uh my thoughts here for a second then, which is the fact that for a strategy, some player managers choose to intentionally walk hitters to put men on to try to have double plays. Now, is there anybody you know of who does not abide by that strategy? You know, I was speaking with Adam Schefter just yesterday, and from his rumors and sources that he spoke to, he informed me that he cannot disclose the names of the PMs that have, have said that they, that they do that. But I, I will say, it's a bold strategy, and it looks like, assuming that uh, this PM, Paul McMichael, had utilized some strategy on defense, is now paying off for him. And there's a pitch that, again, is struck foul by Cal Ripken Jr. He's 3-for-3 three three today with three singles, putting together a little bid for All-Star Game MVP. And he pops one up. No! And the Astros have gotten doubled up. We will see if that will make any difference to them in the end. It looks like I've accidentally skipped over something here. Uh, that might be an eight-run fifth. Did we watch an eight-run fifth? I do not believe we watched an eight-run fifth, Ken. But we might have, Ken. I feel like I'm going to lose my job. 
we'll pick up uh, that here when we get the opportunity to see what happened with all of those runs. I think I misplaced a run somewhere. Maybe they're in your back pocket. We did see a lot of runs, but not that many runs. Very interesting. Interesting, interesting indeed. Well, uh, well, while we look for those runs, we can check out the bombers. Who, they're they're uh, not in my pocket. Uh, I just checked. You don't have them. You don't, I know you don't have them. You couldn't find eight runs if you... It looks like the... If I can just inject for a second while you do some, some searching here. Yes. The PM... Derek Barnhart and his game uh, took the, what we'll call for now, I guess, an all-natural route to the All-Star game in his defense as he continues to not show any power-ups. That's a little surprising. I know that uh, Derek Barnhart is usually the savvy player-manager, but uh, I think he's an idiot. I couldn't agree more. Now, here I am in the top of the fifth. And uh, it's seven to nothing. And I feel like I remember this part. Do you remember this part? I'm having flashbacks. I think I remember this part. Vivid flashbacks. There, here's here's the Sammy Sosa home run here. Let for the viewers at home. Here's the Sammy Sosa home run that put them up seven to nothing. Here's where we have ended that transmission. Correct. Correct. Now they had three, so an eight run anyone put them at eleven. Here's. The next transmission I have, the beginning of the transmission, the Astros are right here. Do you remember this? Top five. Let's do this. You had mentioned Ripken being the MVP with two singles on the day. Is that accurate? No, I mentioned him being the MVP with three singles on the day. Then I guess we jumped the gun. Here we are. We're going back in time to the top of the fifth inning with Cal Ripken Jr., playing a fine shortstop, and I'm just going to give you a call. I think he singles right here. You say single, I say double, but let's see how this plays out. It's got to be a single. I'll bet he gets thrown out at second. And he scampers back to first. You were right, Ken, Jr., 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 I should watch the end of every baseball game. Jr. Jose Canseco here with men on first and third. (laughs) Here's the pitch from Pudge Rodriguez. That's low for a ball. Cowherpin Jr. taking out for second. Raul Mondesi instead trying to take home in the rundown. It seems as if Mondesi had just a quick second of indecision here, but he will score. And that is the eighth run of the Astros. It's a conventional little league play right there. Conventional little league I think that it was... I don't know. I mean, a little trickery there with kind of baiting the, uh, the thrill there to second. Well, if uh, anybody wants to file some kind of investigation, be my guest. There's a strike on the inside corner, one and two to Conseco, who I feel is really looking to um, break out and make something happen right here. You say no way, I say Jose. The one-two delivery. And there's a foul ball back. One thing that impresses me about this kid is even though he still hasn't reached puberty, he still has hair longer than most of my hair. And another foul ball. One and two. Now, I'm really curious as to why we don't see any uh, kind of uh, special hit trickery here. Oh, that ball is right on the line. Picked up by Pudge, and it will be a fair ball. That was incredible. Way to hustle by Jose to get to first, but uh, that third baseman was waiting for that ball to trickle foul, and it never did. Sean Green at the plate, and it looks like he's going to dial in his aluminum power bat. With a swing and a drive to deep right field, it is absolutely pulverized for a three-run home run. And music to my ears, Sean Green, a member of my favorite team, the Montreal Expos, really surprising a lot of people with that ball club. That was a phenomenal blast. Sean Green showing some (laughs) distance and looks like gathering some humor from the PM. Absolutely. Luanne the Wee looks at a strike on the outside corner. You know, I... uh Really haven't come to terms in understanding why Luann just can't let go of the teddy bear. I feel like she should have enough confidence with the way she plays the game that she doesn't need a teddy bear. 
to prove uh, anything. Honestly, I think the teddy bear is uh, just a distraction as Luan needs some sort of other thought at the plate besides pitching to keep her comforted. And there's a ball inside, evening the count at two and two. Luan the Weeb taken in the first round, I believe seventh overall. And I believe purely for her speed, uh, in addition to the inning she can give you on the mound, but she will ground out to the second baseman, bringing Kenny Lofton to the plate, who's one for three today with a home run. Here's the pitch. Strike one on the inside. Interesting approach by Kenny to stay closed here and not utilize any of the batting power-ups. The 0-1 again. Deja vu, strike two. I'm going to go out on a limb here, Ken, and assume that the PM Paul is looking to accumulate more runs by first having runners on base before utilizing the special power-ups. Let's see if he gets what he wants. The 0-2 delivery coming from Pudge Rodriguez. A hook that Kenny brings to the right side and has been overrun. And Kenny's in there with a single. You know, I don't know what that kid at first base, Larry Walker, was thinking as he went the exact opposite direction as the ball was hit. I find that to be uh, just normal behavior for these backyard kids. Looks like there's a big lead at first. And again, we're getting an opportunity to see some of the fastest players in the game do what they do. Kenny Lofton taking second base without any issue whatsoever. Pete Wheeler coming back with an 0-1 chance to do some damage. He bunts. Kenny Lofton takes it out for third. Pete Wheeler safe on first base. Kenny Lofton, instead of finishing that effort to third, retreats to second base, and we've got men on first and second. Which will bring Keisha Phillips to the plate, one for three with a single. Screaming line drive, but it looks like a bit of a dud. It's going to sink. Derek Jeter gloves it and throws and gets Kenny Lofton out at third base. Wow. That was truly great defense. I don't mind taking a look and seeing that one more time. You don't see this very often. When a special power-up is used, it's, for the most part, successful. Derek Jeter looks like he was playing deep in the hole at short, and Keisha, not really getting all of that screaming line drive, Put Kenny Lofton in a position to be a forced out at third base. Let's take a look at this one one more time. Here's the dealing from Pudge, and there's the line drive that just doesn't take. Jeter ranges over with an incredible, incredible play over there at third base. Phenomenal really. range and an arm by Jeter. Just just absolutely stunning. Well, and at this point, it seems as if we've seen all of the offense we're going to see out of the Astros uh, since we have seen their sixth inning of play. So let's go ahead and uh, find out how uh, Derek Barnhart finished out with the pros. It's a baseball game that, like we said, since it is live, I'm not sure if the transmission was just lost in a wormhole or what, because we saw something in the future happen first. That's true. And then something else. You know, it's interesting with these live games, sometimes mm -hmm. the... Television broadcast can be uh, can be held up as they transmit. You know that's that's just one reason why I never loved the, the TBN news that covered backyard baseball. They never brought good quality to the game. I've been pressured by our um, producer Producers. to shave my goatee. Hideous, at best. And instead of protesting that and risking my job, I will bring you to the top of the fifth with the bombers. The bombers here. Only having two runs, really need to capitalize and score some more to catch up to the PM Paul McMichael's 11 that he's boasting at the finish of his game. So here we are. We're coming to uh, the top of five with the Bombers. Due up is Ken Griffey Jr. first, followed by Larry Walker and Juan Gonzalez. Let's come into the action. Now Griffey earlier in this game had a home run, one for two today. Let's go, Dad. Selecting the power selection, he sees the first pitch from Nomar. And there's a drive deep down the left field line. Will it stay fair? That baby's out of here. Another home run by Ken Gr Griffey Jr. 
And Junior with his second homer on the day, showing some serious power at the plate. And it doesn't even surprise me. Ken has had some consistency in his season. But the fact that he's hit two homers here in this All-Star game for the Bombers at this point would make him my MVP for that team. And not only that, but Ken has the charisma of a lion. I tell you what, that kid is an all-around athlete. Real wow. lion charisma. That was phenomenal. To see that ball travel the distance it did with some regular raw power was awesome. I feel like we played that off really well because our studio completely collapsed during that home run and the, all the excitement. And I know nobody at home noticed that. Ice in our veins. The 0-2 to Larry Walker is fouled back. Larry Walker now, you might know he's actually Canadian. Have you ever been to Canada, Ken? Oh, yeah, I've been to Canada. I've had quite the times in Canada, eh? Oh, you have, eh? Sorry there. Low and ball one away. You know what's interesting? In Canada... I was actually just there on a on a on a business trip for being uh, you know an announcer. I had a, a radio interview in person. It was nice to see the warm Canadian Canadian oh, welcome that they yeah. had. Oh yeah, oh yeah, um, some real weather there. I've really and moose <laughs> <laughs> and Larry Walker goes down looking at strike three. I don't know how you look at that pitch. That was right over the plate. If everybody had the uh, the eye. And the swing. There's a ball driven deep by Juan Gonzalez. Way back to center field. And it's gone by the center fielder. Yeah, I feel like they've really just had really been dealt a uh, really difficult hand here recently. Some really deep drives. That one that was brought back. Down to their last out. Chipper Jones is at the plate fouling one off. 0-1. Yeah, you know, it seems from the Bombers that they took, you know, we talked about that natural approach, but I think that they really could have improved with pit selection at the plate. Here's a ball that's lifted high and what looks like to be foul down the third baseline as our live stream is currently uh, on hold. But, uh, you know, as I was saying... The Bombers could have used better pitch selection. I think they really have put in max effort at the plate, though. It, you know, with looking at guys like uh, Juan Gonzalez that had that drive, that was a phenomenal catch by Sammy Sosa. Um, Ken seemed to do what he did, it could do to produce at the plate. Um, you know, I think at the end of the game, we're going to look back and just see that there was just some players that, that could have done uh, more in, in regards to production. And, uh, you know, I think, too that at least from what I see on defense, that Angela Del Vecchio must have done a good job pitching at the plate to silence the computer with zero runs and only two hits. And then again, like I said, because we've seen the Astros' innings of offense, we're going to tune back into uh, the Bombers to come into their top of six. They come into that inning up three to nothing with a run differential of three. So they've got some ground to make up, and it's going to be up to leadoff man Ahmed Khan to get them started. You know, it's interesting. Ahmed Khan's parents actually uh, came over from overseas and uh, made the transition to American life as here comes the first pitch. Swung and missed by Ahmed. I had a discussion with his parents as I was talking about the raw power that Ahmed uh, uh, possesses, and they were just saying that they were thankful to be able to have Ahmed in the States to play some American backyard baseball. Well, and I couldn't agree with them more. This is really the land of hope, prosperity, and possibilities for these kids. At least when it comes to baseball, because we all know that, uh, well, let's just say even if America's pastime is not receiving the kind of recognition we feel like it should. History. It's sure not getting the recognition that we think it should have in the other great nations of this world. Here's a ground ball to the right side, drawing the first baseman and pitcher, and it's a foot race to first, and Ahmed is called out. Nomar with some legs on first base, showing some defensive ability. I want to bring back one more piece of discussion um, and really it comes to the format of the All-Star game 
but it prompted some more thought among the player managers about the way that the league is constructed. Angela grounds out to Nomar, by the way, for the second out, we, and down to their last out now for the game. Down to their last out. So we have we've split the league in, for the purpose of this game, backyard teams and pro teams. But what would it look like to split the league in terms of backyard players and pro players? My initial thought is unfair. You know, you look at the uh, stamina, the power, the defense, the speed of the pro players. And in my opinion, if we're talking of just a full squad of nine, 9v9, nine nine, I'm putting my uh, my money on on the MLB players. What do you think, Ken? Well, I, I think that what you say has a lot of merit, except for Pablo Sanchez. Pablo We're forgetting Sen Pablo there. Yes. Yes. Here's a weak pop fly to the infield, which Norma will cleanly catch for the third and final out of the game as the Bombers can only produce three runs at the plate, though they had some chances to have the long ball produced. They they didn't. Sosa made sure that that, was, uh, that did not happen. And so here I am just fast-forwarding to what we have as the final score, which is for the Bombers – three to nothing and then we've just got to check in with uh the end score of paul's game to see if he gave up runs that made the uh the outcome of the game different so we do have at the end of that game a score of ready for it ready for, we will today can be my, able uh... to get that to you very shortly 11 to 1. 11 to 1. The New York Mets squeeze out a run there and bring the Astros score to 10 over the backyard team 3 to bring victory to the Diamondbacks, Expos, and the Athletics. You know, Ken, I got to ask what your favorite highlight was from watching both of those teams in this All Star game. E apart from the even the family connection I have with my dad. It was still him hitting two bombs. That did my heart uh, lots of good. And uh, I believe that I still have to nominate him as the MVP of this game. We'll just attribute it to good genetics. I would do that, and I'm still looking for my chance to break into the bigs. We'll be having some uh, different all-star game events coming up if you have not already seen them. So please find that video. Until that time, this is Ken Griffey Jr. Jr. alongside my partner Pedro Alvarez saying, have a great night. Glad you could enjoy some backyard baseball with us. Thanks for joining us.